Today's episode is made possible by Affinity Solutions. Unlock your business's potential with actionable insights into consumer spending, powered by Affinity Solutions. With exclusive insights from over 140 million cards, Affinity Solutions showcases consumer purchase behavior with unprecedented clarity. Seize the opportunity to reshape your strategy with accuracy, execute with precision, and measure with confidence. Affinity Solutions equips you to outperform in today's competitive landscape. Step into the future of analytics with Affinity Solutions today. Hello everyone, and thanks for hanging out with us for the Behind the Numbers Weekly Listen, the last one of the year, an e-marketer podcast made possible by Affinity Solutions. This is the Friday show. That feels like it's gonna regret having Paul on. At some <laughs> point throughout the episode, you'll realize why. I'm not a mean person, that'll, mm. you'll, you'll realize why. I don't know. Right, Paul? I can just see. <sighs> um, yeah, I mean, the only part I would disagree I with, you said you said at some point during the episode, and because we're on video, I think that point is going to be right now. So oh, God. I hope you all bear with me. I just have to. Um, Woo! A little wardrobe change. Also, I'm, I'm just going to move to another room, so just bear with me a second. There we go. Oh, okay. my goodness. A background, too? Oh, that was awesome. So seamless. Oh, just, just moving to another room, as I said. I don't know too what much. you mean about background. Too much, Paul. Paul, do you want to explain why you're doing this to me, specifically? Yeah, I'll explain it to you. I think our listeners know that um, this is the week that we celebrate the first anniversary of we? Argentina winning the oh. FIFA Men's World Cup. But Marcus, because you and I have not talked about this very much and I haven't emailed you every day Once to remind you of this. Yep. Um, I day, just yeah. want to make it, you know, clear to you as well for your benefit. Good God, this is going to be so a horrible Is this the episode. first time Argentina won? It is the third time. Huh. The third time. That's why when I send Marcus these reminders, I usually put three stars, one for each you wait, victory. you wait till England finally will win, Paul. I'm going to come to your home. <laughs> has England never won? I look won? forward to that. England has. Uh, Basically yeah, never, back, yeah. <laughs> back before any of us were born. Uh, uh, even yeah. me. 30, 30 years ago. Okay, oh, I wish. Uh, double that. I'm your host, Marcus <laughs> Johnson. In today's show, is this the very beginning of how Amazon ends? Welcome to the ad-free internet. Should we be pairing shopping with streaming? What can we expect from X at this year's Super Bowl? That's Twitter, for people who still haven't figured, you know, out that they changed their name. ChatGPT signs a huge deal with a giant publisher. And what are the most visited tourist attractions in the whole world? Join me for this episode. We have three people. Let's meet them. We start with our Vice President of Content, heads up our retail desk. It's Susie David Canyon. Hi, thanks for having me. Hello, hello. Based in New York. We're also joined by someone else based in New York. Someone on that very retail desk, senior analyst, Blake Drosh. Pleasure to be here, Marcus. Do we have to like smile and stuff when we talk now that no, you're fine. we're on video? Uh, okay. Don't good. pretend. I wasn't no, I, your I, usual I, surly self. <laughs> that, I, I heard a, an uptick in your answer there, actually. In, in the tone? Yeah. Yeah, you could yeah. you could fake the tone, but the smile is just it's just so much harder. <laughs> and finally, Argentine professional footballer who plays as a forward for MLS club Inter Miami from Rosario, Argentina. It's Lionel Messi. Muchas gracias. Es un placer estar con todos ustedes hoy. Indeed. Or if we're being real, Marcus, <laughs> and you're actually introducing me as opposed to you know, and, and I'm very honored to be compared to Lionel Messi, but. I don't know if you all recall, but from watching the World Cup ceremony, when the cup was handed out, Messi was given the traditional Qatari shirt that was black. So I think I'm going to kind of simulate that by putting this back on, which also happens to match with Susie and our branded insider intelligence. Sorry. Where is it? Other side. Other side. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Insider intelligence uh, logo here. So. This is going to... It's going to be a long episode. That's the VP of content based just above New York City, Paul Werner. Anyway, what do you have in store for you folks? Start the story of the week. Uh, is, this the, is this the very beginning of how Amazon ends? We then move to the game of the week where our contestants will try to duke it out for a championship belt. And we end with some random trivia. We call it dinner party data. But we start, of course, with the story of the week. Is this the very beginning of how Amazon ends? 
An open embrace of cheap foreign products has helped Amazon take over the world. It also might guarantee Amazon's eventual obsolescence, writes Amanda Mull of The Atlantic. She thinks that over time, Amazon has transformed itself into something that functions more like a global flea market than a traditional retail store, saying folks search the site looking for products that are good enough and scanning multiple reviews for making, sorry, before making this low stakes gamble of a purchase, as she calls it. The success of this system is what has made the retailer into the everything store. It might also be what leads to the eventual end of Amazon's dominance. She goes on to say, for several years running, American media have been puzzling over the rise of a new crop of ultra cheap international retailers like Shein and Timu who ship much of their inventory directly to Western buyers from Chinese suppliers. These mega retailers take off uh, in the U.S., uh, at least took off in the U.S. by charming young shoppers in the early days of the pandemic with clothing so cheap um, that it made H&M look like a splurge. So that is how we set the table talking about whether this is the very beginning of Amazon's uh, end of at the end of Amazon's dominance, not the end of Amazon, we should probably say, Susan, you cover retail for us, um, or at least you cover and also head up the team. Well, what do you make of this idea that Amazon, it, maybe it's peaked and it's kind of on, on the decline to a certain extent because of folks like Shimu, uh, nope, folks like uh, Timu and Shien. I combined them into one mega company with that name. Actually, do think it's hyperbolic in that Amazon is not going to die a slow death or a quick death because of the Chinese players. However, I do think that Amazon is trying to protect itself by doing new things like trying to be a little bit cooler by intensifying its fashion assortment. What will cause it to start losing more market share more quickly is the lack of stores. They just recently closed the mm. style stores and that was a super bust. They've been closing lots of the different sort of iterations of physical footprint. The only thing they have left is grocery and even that's not going super well. So yes, I think Amazon is so far ahead of everybody else that it's not these little players that are going to make a difference, but I think they're just smart and they're getting ahead. So Blake, let me throw it to you because you're also on the, on the retail desk. Um, they're definitely, you know, they're not as close, near, nearly as close as Amazon, as big as, big as Amazon. And, and similar to cable, you know, going down and down, but there's still 40% odd folks who still have cable, even though it has been declining for, you know, a, a decade and a half plus. Um, so they're not as big, but they are as big as some of the other smaller, uh, re sm smaller re like retailers like Target, especially in the US. So um, Amazon's weighed, uh, made way more than she and, and, and Timu. So they made $220 billion last year in revenue from online sales. Um, but that you've got Shein and Timu who are making about $20 billion a piece. That's about the same as much, uh, same amount as, as Target made online and these these retailers also like pretty brand new so given that growth tra trajectory do you do you see as being as more of a threat to amazon than perhaps it looks on, on the surface no not really i mean i tend to agree with Susie. i think that you know the one thing that this article sort of misses is that uh the allure of amazon isn't necessarily about the products as much as it's about the customer experience that amazon offers uh timu and Shein are, are basically replicating one aspect of amazon which is you know, selling cheap offshore products of dubious quality. Um, but as the article points out, that's often an aspect of Amazon that a lot of customers don't really like. The other side of Amazon is that all of the major CPG brands sell on the platform, on the marketplace. Uh, so you can get the same high quality products uh, on Amazon that you can get anywhere else in any major retailer online or offline. Uh, but if you're a Prime member, you can order them more seamlessly and get them faster than any other online retailer. Uh, and that's really what's keeping Amazon dominant, as, particularly as people are buying more of their, you know, essential goods and every everyday household items online. And that's a space where, you know, Timu and Shein aren't even vying for, uh, let alone, you know, putting a dent in Amazon's e-commerce dominance. Well, and the whole thing about these players is gamification. And so while Amazon doesn't have that. It certainly has that treasure hunt, sort of like you never know what you're going to get. Yeah. You know, all those sponsored ads make it so cluttered, the experience online, that you are treasure hunting, quote unquote, to find what you're looking for and to feel good about the deal. The other thing I think Amazon doesn't have in a good way, sort of, sorry, the other thing that Amazon 
has that the others don't is the quick shipping, right? Here we're about consumerism and quick gratification and constant stimulus. And so part of the reason why these brands are so cheap, these like no name brands are so cheap, it's because it takes weeks to get the merchandise, right? You've already bought it and you've forgotten about it and then it appears. Whereas on Amazon, you get it right away. And so I think th these are not the folks that are going to take Amazon down. Paul, um, coming to you for a second. So there's a Bloomberg piece cited in this article saying that the rise of these retailers, Timu, Xi'an, meant piles of Chinese junk topped Christmas lists for US consumers. So that was a quote from the article. But Miss Mull uh, from The Atlantic pointing out that Americans, saying that's probably a, a bit of an unfair statement, but saying Americans have been snapping up inexpensive imported stuff Chinese and otherwise for decades since the shelves of Walmart, Target, Costco, among others, are full of cheap foreign products. Uh, this is the reality of American shopping, whether or not buyers realize it. Do you think, you know, eventually the, these these names, Shein, Timu, can become kind of household names similar to Amazon? Really, the difference is that people have been shopping on Amazon for a long time and they just kind of trust the brand more. I think... You know, part of me wants to look at this whole thing and say, okay, Amazon, you've created this monster and now it's coming to eat you. But I think the reality is much more along the lines of what Susie and Blake described. Amazon has a lot of different levers. It can pull a lot of different businesses. It has AWS. It has its media business content. It has Twitch. It's just, you know, it has grocery. I mean, it just has so many areas that it operates in. And this is just a sliver of it. It's it's really just a sliver of their right. e-commerce business. And Amazon could very easily use this as an opportunity, for example, to pivot to more of a quality focus instead of like emphasizing some of the aspects that they've emphasized. So in other words, come to Amazon and you're going to get trustworthiness, reliability, quality products, accountability on the part of the, the merchants, a lot of things that I think Timu and, and Xi'an are not in a position to offer right now. And it would probably take them a lot more to scale that up than it would take Amazon to make a pivot along those lines. And that I don't know which author said good enough, but like no brand should ever operate on good enough. Like there is nothing sustainable about a good enough brand image. So, you know, not only is it bad quality and so people will get tired of that, it's not coming quickly enough. But like Blake said, it's also not branded merchandise at some point, especially as there are more and more, you know, uh, food recalls and other sort of product recalls, people are going to start to pay more attention to what they're buying. I think Miss Mo was saying that that's how consumers, I'm curious what to know what you think, Susie, that's how they look at Amazon now, is that they're, they're not expecting the most perfect high quality things in the world. They know that they're sacrificing, um, you know, high quality, amazing high quality guaranteed for uh, an insane uh, horde of, of products to, to sift through. You know, I think it depends on how you shop. Like I shop by brand. And so I shop by item by brand. Point. So I don't see those things. Right. And then I also shop for Amazon Prime. So like if I'm going to buy something on Amazon, it's because I want to get it as quickly as possible. Otherwise, yeah. I have other retailers I go to. So yeah. maybe for some people, but I can't imagine that it's for the majority. And I don't know what the household income is for Prime members, the average, but they were saying for some of these Chinese players, it's $40,000 $40, household income averages. And so, I mean, like that is definitely they're going for down and dirty, cheap kind of merchandise, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, what, 15, 20 below the US average. Yeah, but they don't have a choice. These are people who have to really stretch their dollar. So it's not it's right. not good or bad. It's just they don't have another option necessarily. Mm -hmm. All right, folks, that's where we'll leave the story of the week. Time now for the game of the week. Today's game, what's the point? Maybe next year we'll do something different. Probably not. I read out four stories and Susie Blake and Paul give us the main takeaway of the story. Okay, answers get one point. Good answers get two. And answers to give you the same feeling as when you get home and transition to sweatpants. And one. Yeah. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you've been wearing sweatpants for too long. I'm a jeans in the house kind of guy. Really? Same. same. Yeah. Really? Same. You come home from taking the subway I'm and the you same, don't actually. change your pants? Yeah. No one said didn't change them, just change into a different pair of jeans, right? Uh, like, oh, okay. That's fair. Paul puts on his Argentina. Uh, Paul's butler. He said it, not me. Yeah. I have my butler okay. bring me a robe and then uh, a selection <laughs> yeah. of, of ironed jeans. jeans. Yeah. Yep. A yep. selection of Argentina kits. 
Yeah. I like to think you're wearing the full kit, Paul. Um, With some you know, I am as well. <laughs> you know what I think is going to change for next year? You're going to keep score properly. What do you mean properly? It's always been properly. Okay. No. We all know it's not. Only when you lose is it apparently not properly. <laughs> uh, I'll also leave you with the sweatpants for, uh, feelings. That gives you uh, three points, 20 seconds to answer before you hear the bell. Don't run long. <laughs> Blake. Oh. Whoever has most points wins, gets the last word. Let's play before Blake can make a cheeky comment. Round one. You have. I meant Susie. I'm always. I just quick. say Susie every week, so I thought I'd make it feel a bit better. <laughs> Round one. Let's start with <laughs> my oh. dinner party data is going to be really long. I'm very excited about it. No one's surprised. Uh, welcome to welcome. What was that? Slow food movement. If your dinner party data is long, so you know you're <laughs> sitting down for a nice long Mediterranean <laughs> style meal, right, Susie? That's it. We have to move past these bad jokes. Uh, pause up first. Uh, Round one. Welcome them. to the ad. I know. Welcome to the ad free internet. The Economist writes. Uh, noting that as rich uh, as the rich pay to banish commercials, advertisers hunt for their attention elsewhere. It points out Meta offers folks in Europe ad-free paid versions of Facebook and Instagram. X, also known as Twitter, just launched an ad-free option, and TikTok and Snapchat are both testing some as well. And Brian Weezer of Madison and Wall says, "quote We are in a world where it will be increasingly possible to avoid ads." Close quote. Uh, but Paul, is the internet actually becoming more ad-free? I have a lot of issues with this article. So on the point of Meta and TikTok and X experimenting with ad-free subscriptions, yes, they're doing that, but we don't know yet if those are going to stick around, if they're effective. The article talks about the growing number of people who pay for online news content, but it doesn't mention that a lot of this comes from publishers basically not giving people a choice. It also doesn't mention whether the subscription revenue from these people is additive. It talks about Spotify, 40% uh, of their users pay for the ad-free tier, but doesn't mention that this percentage has actually been dropping steadily since 2019. And it also, in my opinion, overlooks the fact that in the streaming video space, which generates more ad revenue than news and audio combined, all these ad-supported tiers and platforms are gaining a lot of ground. And frankly, I think it takes some of Brian Weezer's research a little bit out of context. So... Uh, a lot of problems with this article, which I know is trying to be prov provocative with its headline. So mm. they get points for that. Susie. So I do think that there could be a world where the internet will have less ads, but I, I don't know that we're there and I think we're masking it, right? So it's not that there won't be ads. It's just that you're going to pay to not have an ad uh, experience. And if you choose to do that, you're still going to get the influencers that are doing unboxing and sort of other more covert advertising styles, which I think is probably worse, right? If advertisers just had a little bit less annoying ads that were properly targeting me, I wouldn't need to skip them and I would be happy to see them. Hmm. Blake that the internet is becoming ad free is is really just a cloak for the fact that it's shifting like it always does and i think all of those points that were made you know resonate uh some social users might pay extra for an ad free experience but the majority is still going to opt to use the free service with ads as paul mentioned uh you know the percentage of connected tv users uh has been growing for years and it's making up a large and larger percentage of digital video viewers uh and then you know susie's point um about influencer marketing and earned media on social media there's still going to be ways for uh brands to reach users who decide to uh, use the free service without ads, but the ecosystem is really just evolving. And as media on the internet continues to become more and more fragmented, people are going to be using more and more different services, whether it's more social networks or more uh, AVOD uh, streaming platforms. And they're just going to be more willing to watch ads to access more content rather than they're going to stick to a single platform and pay for a to be ad free. Mm. I like this line from The Economist the existence of ad free options does not guarantee take up. Um, round two. Let's start with Susie pairing shopping with streaming. Two related stories here. One, Disney is exploring adding gaming and shopping to its streaming service, Disney Plus. More details are expected at this year's Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas. And the second story is Walmart planning to launch its first shoppable video series, a holiday themed romantic comedy called 
add to heart roku tiktok and youtube is that uh, is where it will be uh this is according to an article from senior retail analyst zach stambor he notes the 23 part series weaves the retailer and 330 shoppable products throughout its plot but susie are shopping and streaming a good pairing so I think the way I would describe this is a little bit differently in that there's two different types of content on streaming, right? There are the Netflix of the world that have a series that you can stop and buy whatever you want. And we've talked about it on the show before. So will that work? Probably not. You're not going to stop in the middle of the horror scene or the intrigue to buy the shoes the girl is wearing, or was it maybe on Amazon? Remember, we? I think it was us two talking about it. So in that way, it's not going to work, right? You're not going to interrupt what you're doing. It'll inspire people. People. So they do go hand in hand, but that's not different from product placement. But what the Walmart and Home Depots of the world are doing is creating content a little bit like QVC or live stream shopping, where you're pretending to watch something that is story related, but all in all, it's just about shopping. So that I think will work until the novelty wears off and then people will just be annoyed about it. Mm, like. Just an experimentation ground for the technology that's going to be applied to future use for actual programming because, uh, you know, if the content is good and engaging, it's worth experimenting and adding shoppable media in and around it. But what Walmart's doing here is just really content for the sake of making it shoppable, uh, which says to me that this is just, you know, one of the many, many tests that Walmart has been uh, producing over a series of years just to sort of figure out what that mix light might look like that does work. Oh, I think to Susie's point, interrupting programming like dramas and and also sports so those are probably the two most coveted types of programming on connected tv that's kind of a non-starter as far as i'm concerned the walmart experiment does seem like potentially a new genre i mean you know um i, I can remember when there was no reality tv so like that came out of nowhere and it just took over so maybe this is something that catches on but I think the bar is pretty high. And I think that culturally, we don't generally associate like streaming video with shopping directly. And I think that the experiments that have been done so far with any kind of interactive ads on CTV have really not played out um, to on, on any kind of scale. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would add, which I'm sorry, I know that gives yeah. me a red card, but... Uh... <laughs> I'm just going to assign myself red cards. You but, should. you know, we didn't think about or maybe we didn't talk about it, but we thought about the delivery, right? If you're streaming it on your phone, that process, if it's a one click to cart to your doorstep without really thinking about it at all and interrupting whatever you're doing, much more likely to work than if you're streaming it onto your TV and then it's a clunky experience. So content and experience matters. Great point. Um, yeah, we have a high number of shoppable media buyers expected this year. We, we expect we forecast 100 million, nearly 100 million Americans will be shoppable media buyers this year. What does that mean? Uh, digital consumers who after engaging with online media content that has immediate purchase options, take actions like clicking through a call to action link or uh, on a live streaming video or scanning a QR code on a TV. This doesn't mean it's a frequent behavior. Um, but it's still surprising to see that many Americans doing doing something like this. It's it's also a heavy, heavy percentage of social commerce because a lot of social commerce fault buyers fall uh, within the shoppable it. media forecast. Right. Yeah, there we are. Which supports um, Susie's point because that's in a mobile environment. Yes. But I think if you're looking at it from the from Disney's standpoint, you know, it re their experience is much more centered around the big screen and around sit down entertainment whether it's sports or or entertainment content. So mm -hmm. I think in that context, it's just not as viable. Yeah. At the halfway mark, Paul is just out in front uh, with six. Susie and Blake tied behind on five. Uh, very good game so far, folks. Very high scoring. Round three, we start with Blake. Brands shifting spending from X slash Twitter to alternatives for the Super Bowl in 2024. Uh, reassessing some deals, apparently, writes Trishler Oswal of Adweek. This year's game played at the start of 2023 saw a near 70% free fall in Super Bowl ad spending. Apparently, um, in recent years, the NFL, this is on X on Twitter. Uh, in recent years, the NFL finals has brought in about 35 million in US ad revenue for X slash Twitter over the weekend. No, it's the Wall Street Journal. But Blake, what would this year's Super Bowl look like in light of the uh, X or Twitter uh, uh, controversy? 
Yeah, this one's really interesting because there really is no alternative for a platform that gets the type of real-time engagement that Twitter gets during mm. these really high-profile public events. I think, you know, some brands are definitely going to be noticeably absent. You're probably not going to see a ton of big engagements, but the reality is that there will be, uh, you know, an increased uh, level of user activity on the platform during these events, even if the overall, you know, monthly active users uh, continues to fall on Twitter or sorry, on X. Um, but I think you'll, you'll see some more experimentation, particularly on, on TikTok, um, maybe even Instagram too, as a way to, to reach consumers during the game um, because of the, you know, brand safety issues that a lot of um, uh, brands are feeling when it comes to, to X, especially around a high profile event like the Super Bowl, where things can, you know, go wrong at a moment's notice. It seems a little volatile. Cool. Well, I see Blake's point about X being particularly conducive to, to marketers in that in in that environment around the Super Bowl, but I also subscribe to the point of view that my colleague, uh, principal analyst for social media, Jasmine Emberg makes about X being not a must have for most marketers. I think what's more to the point though, is that you know the New York Times recently estimated that X lost or will lose about $75 million just in Q4. So then if you add to that the 35 million that this ad week article expects they might lose around the super bowl that's 110 million dollars all from self-inflicted issues that have mm -hmm. nothing to do with the platform they have to do with a very erratic leader who's creating these problems for for himself and and for the business susie so i actually never thought about X as an advertising haven, to be honest with you. I thought about it more like the central area where people go, the, you know, the court area where people go and chat. And so to think that the conversation is going to lack is 100%, right? Nobody's going to be there to talk and engage. The actual advertising, I can't even figure out where they were spending that much money. I think it leaves a lot of room for unboxing and taste testing and doing driving of the cars and like back end, how did this commercial get shot? Sort of different ways of engaging with the consumer in short video style, whether it's YouTube or Instagram, which will be fun, I think, much more fun mm -hmm. than listening to people talking about what was your favorite ad or reading about what was your favorite yeah. ad and what was the new Doritos commercial or the Labatt's commercial or whatever it is. So I think yeah. it's great. Miss Ostwall of, uh, of Adweek expecting less spends, not mass boycotts, uh, saying rather than completely pulling their presence on X, it's more likely brands reduce their media strategy to just organic content or put some dollars into selective ad products like in-stream video to have some control over brand risk. Let's move to round four, folks. Uh, Before we do that, I just want to say it was very sly of Susie to drop in a Canadian brewer into... Yes. Her uh, list of examples, um, though, Every frankly, week. Susie, a little shameless to plug your country that way. I don't know who does that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Iceless, Susie. before Iceless. you know it, I'm going to have a Canadian flag on my Christmas. You day. should. You yeah. should. Started, Paul. I mean, be ready. After Marcus, Marcus said that his dinner party data was around most visited tourist sites. And I'm pretty sure he's mm -hmm. going to ask us what we think and be ready for mine. I won't, I won't ask. Hey, that you. you have to. Stuart, who runs the team, this video podcast idea was terrible. We have to cancel it immediately. The not halfway mark, three quarter mark, heading into round four, double points, round four. Paul's just out in front with eight. Susie and Blake with seven. Actually, you know what? No, those answers were really good. Let's bump that up. So Paul's still out ahead with nine. Susie and Blake uh, with eight apiece. It's been a fantastic game, folks. Only one person can win, though. We move to round four. I mean, if we nobody believed me that you made up the scoring, you just <laughs> proved it to everybody. No, I just thought that all of the they were all good. So instead of all getting two, you all get three. Which makes no difference at all because Paul's still ahead. Uh, round four. We start with Paul. Chat GPT creator OpenAI will pay news publishing giant Axel Springer for using its content uh, content to populate answers in Chat GPT and train its AI tools. Axel Springer is actually our parent company, along with uh, Business Insider, who they own, Politico, and many others. Alexandra Bruel of The Wall Street Journal thinks that this multi-year licensing deal is a significant milestone as media companies push for compensation for the use of their content in AI tools. But Paul, how big of a deal is this tie-up between OpenAI and parent company of a lot of folks, including us, Axel Springer? 
I think it's a very big deal because it creates a new potential revenue stream for all publishers. I mean, obviously, Axel Springer is taking a leap forward and kind of like being the first to do this. I think more deals like this are are likely. There are a lot of unexplored uh, aspects of this that I think are going to continue to surface in terms of the content that gets served and ownership of the content. And a lot of the questions that we've been debating around chat GPT and, and around AI, generative AI in gen, uh, overall. But I think in terms of a business deal and what it sets forth for other publishers, it's pretty significant. Susie. I think this is brilliant. It's a win-win, right? For chat GPT, we all talk about garbage in, garbage out. So it brings all this credibility. They're going to have sourcing. They're going to have access. They also apparently have a deal with Reuters. They're going to have access to all this archived information to have smarter answers. So it's going to make their product better. And like Paul said, for the publishers, it's a new revenue stream. And it might even bring new subscribers who constantly see the sourcing and they're like, wait a second, I should probably subscribe to this and get more information and more news. So I think it's win-win. And maybe we'll have an ad-free internet after all, if everybody starts uh, or goes back to subscribing to news sites. <laughs> totally. And I find they did it very cleverly because it's not exclusive. So they can go and sell their stuff to any other open AI style, AI, any kind of technology tool and mm. make even more money. Love it. Like, Well, I think that uh, because of the fact that Axel Springer technically owns the Weekly Listen podcast, well, uh, including well, the dinner party data section. I'm I'm very worried that the future of human and and artificial intelligence intelligence might be contingent upon erroneous information that is sometimes uh, divulged during the dinner party data segment. So I think that we're all going to have to recognize this immense responsibility that we have going forward and really be careful. Uh, here's looking at you, Susie, about the accuracy <laughs> of our dinner party data like so that it doesn't show any credible biases towards, you know, things like, uh, you know, Canada being a preferable country. Armenia. Uh, Armenia being a preferable country. Cadbury preferable chocolate. Country. Should I keep going? And all of them, all of the many um, uh, biases that we we may be guilty of on dinner, the dinner party data section, using to one up each other's and yeah. and our, our respective. Um, I need a new recognizing this. I need a new so dinner well. party data set. Oh God. Darn. Well, the thing is, uh, insider intelligence is not part of the deal. So no, rest assured no, no, no. that so, anything that we publish, which is never biased and always full of fact. Is is not part of that deal unless it's Susie's dinner party data. Uh, so well, uh, <laughs> this is well, I, this is the one. Otherwise, insider accurate. intelligence is you know we always we obviously take accuracy very 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 uh, you know seriously, and I think the one potential the one potential hole in the entire organization. Susie's have dinner the dinner party data. data. Yeah. First of all, so my facts are night. actual. They are real. I'm not making up facts. I'm The whole point is to help educate our colleagues and listeners. And okay. so that is why I'm telling you about places that you've never been to or things you've never thought of. They like the hug, the 10 second hug. Like that That's was probably too my long top to hug 10. Someone. Yeah, top, top 10 Top worst. 10 dinner party data facts. Hug. For people who didn't listen to that episode, Susie suggested uh, hugging people all people for with 10 consent. seconds with consent come on we had some still, underlying with, yes rules. with consent with consent it's still weird you so hug weird. next next time you got a loved one who you know is going to enjoy a hug from you you try and hug them for 10 seconds i'm gonna count watch them put you in the chokehold i would be yeah, i would long. be very i'd be very shook if somebody hugged Thank me you. for 10 i'd be like <laughs> is this the last time we're ever going to see each other like are you like going on a what you know perilous boat journey uh-huh yeah what have you done wrong that you need to It's you fact, need to though. Next ten time I see Blake, hugs. I'm just going to hug him for 10 incredibly oh awkward seconds. All right, that's, the end. <laughs> that's all we've got for the uh, for the game of the week. Two things for me quick. So it's about compensation, but also traffic. So Susie, you kind of touched on this. Wall Street Journal article explaining that ChatGPT uses information from Axel Springer uh, pu publications 
to answer a user's query, and it will include links to the original uh, sources of information below the, the answer. Um, the new format will uh, which will generate an answer in the form of a summary, and it uh, will come out in a few months. But it, the aim here is to ensure that those websites get credit compensation and web traffic. If people already have the answer, I'm very, very skeptical that they're going to continue to click on the link. Maybe they will, but I think fewer people will as a result of these chatbots. Um, other deals to follow, uh, on the one hand, Jeremy Goldman uh, who writes for our briefing was pointing out that this comes as the New York Times uh, helped form a coalition to sue AI leaders like Google and OpenAI for using their content in AI model training, concerned about the impact on site traffic and unattributed uh, data use. On the other, uh, the, the Associated Press already has a deal with OpenAI related to training it. So interesting to see uh, where other folks land on this, uh, this AI um, revolution issue, whatever you want to call it. That's what we've got time for for the game of the week. Let's check the scores and... Don't need a drum roll. Paul won. It's Paul Werner, aka mm. Lionel Messi, world champion. Congratulations, Congratulations. Paul, to you. Thirteen to you, Susie and Blake, with twelve apiece. A very high-scoring game indeed. You get the championship belt. You can hold on through the holidays and the new year. Um, and also the last word. Okay. Well, the last word. First off, I think I tend to only win these things at the end of the year because I won the the championship round last year this time oh, yeah. so very <laughs> grateful for that but i just want to people consolation i want to thank all of our listeners and wish everyone a very peaceful and restful holiday season and i also want to give a special shout out to, to me oh, to cool. you and to everyone oh, behind the scenes the i know i know marcus you always mention the folks who put this show together but a really special mention to victoria grace uh, who is our audio editor, and Lance John, who's now doing the video part of this podcast. Both of them, by the way, fun facts, they have um, first, uh, their last names are first names, which is, I think, a criteria for hiring people here. <laughs> um, yes, Stuart, what's that about? And I also want to uh, special send a special shout out to Stu Entner, who pulls all of the strings, puppet master, and just a great guy, great guy to work with. So thank you all for making this uh, great, but also fun. Well said, though, Paul. Uh, thank you to all those folks. Uh, Danny has helped us with video, too. We've got uh, James, who copy edits the show, uh, yes. and Sophie, who, uh, who does our social media, and everyone who's been on um, or listened and been a part of it. So huge thank you to everyone for making this a thing still. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, do not take it for granted for, for one second. That's what we've got time for for the game of the week. Let's move quickly to dinner party data. <laughs> It's the part of the show where we tell you about the most interesting thing we've learned this week. We'll move fast on this. We start with Paul, because he's the winner. Yeah, so this is uh, very timely. The longest it took a song to get to number one on the Billboard Hot 100. Anybody want to guess how many years? Um, I would say 42. Years. Oh, I've got 42. Well, what, what was that, Blake? What was yours? I would say 40 years. And Susie, any guesses? 25. Okay, 65 is the answer. Wow. Because what? Brenda Lee's Rocking Around the Christmas Tree, it just beat that record. It shattered that record. It took 65 years. It was released in 19... Jeez, I don't even know. It was right when we won the World Cup. <laughs> so that was... Yeah, pretty <laughs> much. Yeah, 65 years ago. I can't do the math off the top of my head right now, but... The prior record was 25 years between the release of Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas Is You in 1994 and its rise to number one in 2019. So that is remarkable. It goes along the lines of an, an item, a dinner party data item that my colleague Max Willens um, had a few weeks ago, which was about the longest it took a company to go mm, from uh, being yeah. founded to its IPO. Along the lines of Brenda Lee breaking this record, there are like a hundred, uh, well, several other records that she broke. Um, the longest span of number ones, the longest break between number ones, because she had number one records back in like the 50s and the 60s. The fact that she's still with us and is able to celebrate this milestone is even sweeter. So congratulations, Brenda. And um, yeah, amazing achievement. Remarkable. Very nice way to kick us off. Let's move straight to Susie. 
So this is the last week before we all tune out a little bit and start thinking about our New Year's resolutions. There are lots and lots of ways to celebrate the new year. A lot of countries do very different things. In the U.S., we are really well known for making resolutions. One in three people usually do that. Oh, and most of the time, people make up three resolutions that they're going to try and keep. However, after three months, they kind of drop off on average. But I thought maybe you guys don't know where this comes from. So New Year's have been celebrated since the ancient Babylonian times, which is like 4,000 years ago. They started with a 12-day festival called Akitu, which started in March, and they were making pledges to the gods. And they were trying to make sure that the gods would give them favorable uh, crops. And that turned into Julius Caesar, who moved it from March to January 1st and they were honoring the god I might say it wrong I'm not sure Janus this does not count as inaccurate facts these are right facts this, just this Canadian the pronunciation of intelligence <laughs> depends the god of the sun right it, um two-faced god that looked both back and forward okay. so looked back at what happened in the previous year and looked forward to ensure that they would offer the right sacrifices and made good promises to that god um the romans uh for good behavior and they believed that if they broke the promises, bad things would happen. And then by the 1600s, it became much more common. And even by the 18th century, it was part of Christianity in some way around reflecting on the past and making resolutions to do better. So do you all know what the number one resolution for 2024 will be? Improve fitness. On less. Oh, sorry. I was hey. going to say improve fact checking. <laughs> These are all factual. This comes from Forbes Health. One poll, 1,000 U.S. adults were polled. Number one is improve fitness. One in two people, that is their goal. Uh, last year for 2023, it was uh, around mental health and mental health wellness. So it's moved to physical wellness this year. The most important thing when you're doing your resolutions next, uh, next week is to think about uh, the tone that you're using and action resolutions, you will have more chance of keeping them than things to avoid. Like I'm going to drink less. I'm going to play less video games. You will be less likely to keep those than if you think about, I'm going to try a new hobby. I'm going to travel to new places. More likely to keep those. Susie. Yes. Must I charge my laptop before it shuts off? We had this one already. Stop. Come on. When did you have this one? It's Unbelievable. now. Unbelievable. Do you really? Did you really? <laughs> the exact same one? Yeah, this was mine. This oh. was mine last this was mine last year. Oh, so everyone wow. who's loyal I... listeners will be like, what the hell's going on, Marcus? <laughs> did did you it have the exact same fact? Yeah, where New Year's resolutions come from. Yeah, January of last year. So I apologize to the listeners. For this well, recycled at least now material. We know that I apologize to the listeners and to OpenAI. Yeah. yeah OpenAI is... got back to going they, well. It was I mean... scanning last year's <laughs> podcast and it scanned this year's podcast. And it's like, wait, I already got this information. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You don't have the top ones. You didn't have the, it was a brand new survey. You couldn't have had this. That we might not have had. The rest of it was, yeah, was six um... out of 10 people. I'm just going to keep giving more also, facts then. Six don't... out of 10 feel pressured to set a New Year's resolution. And after fitness, it's finances, one in three. And you can have multiple, as we said, three three goals. We already had this a year ago. Paul, and in, sorry, fairness to, in fairness to Susie, one of her resolutions for next year is to recycle more. So yeah, there yeah. you go. Care about <laughs> well the environment. Great start. Thank uh, you, Paul. I, I can always job, count on but you. We already had that stuff. I can't believe you did you not. Used... Come on. Did we you have a the year whole ago? Thing? Listen, go back and listen to No, this. I have to think forward. I don't look back. January 31st. Uh, oh no, January sec, uh, January sixth, the week to listen, is when we had it. But thank so you anyway rude. for reminding people of my how important <laughs> of my dinner party day from a year ago. Blake, you're up, mate. Um, so sad. I'm pretty sure that we've featured some iteration of this <laughs> data before. <laughs> now you're hedging your bet. This is important. This is really important data, and it's really important to keep a a track on you know just so we can keep our pulse on on what people think just because it's such an important issue uh and this is from YouGov, and go. it asks 
is Die Hard a Chris, a Christmas movie? The uh, one of the age old, highly contested debates. Uh, the numbers from this age year old. are in, and they polled uh, they polled U.S. adults uh, in mid November twenty twenty three. Thirty nine percent of U.S. adults say yes, Die Hard is in fact a Christmas movie. Eleven percent say. They're not sure, which is pretty good that like that many people have an opinion on this. Yeah. 50% say no, Die Hard is not a Christmas movie. What do you think? I think that 50% of Americans are wrong. <laughs> Die Hard is <gasps> absolutely a Christmas. And I'll tell you why. Yeah, what makes it a Christmas movie? Because it's nothing short of a Christmas miracle that John McClane can save Nakatomi Plaza from terrorism while at the same time saving his own marriage. <laughs> Fair. And I, ref I will re refuse to be told otherwise that that is that a Die Hard is not. A Christmas All right, movie. that sells it. I think Blake's got. Yeah, it's a good point. All right, fair <laughs> enough. Uh, let's move to one. <laughs> one more for the year, folks. I uh, got one more for you. I hope it's not recycled. The mo no, it won't be. I wouldn't dream of it. The most visited tourist attractions in the world. <laughs> Mount Ararat. To a, uh, one second, Susie. Let Disney me set World. it up. Let me set the table. This is according to a far and wide um, article. So think about it. Or oh, unless you're Susie, just yell stuff out. Think about it. One guess each. Uh, whoever gets the most visited attraction wins. Mount Beach. Ararat in Armenia. No. And no, Canada did, Canada did not make It's not top. Niagara Falls. I'm sure it's the Eiffel Tower, but I wanted to talk about Armenia today. Uh, Eiffel Tower also is it, no it's in 36. Oh, really? Is is Mecca a tourist attraction? Uh, no. Okay, so then Disney World it was either going to oh. be one of those two. Let me just triple check what you said the first time. Yeah, no, it's not. Um, Disney does feature. Yeah, Disney is eighth and ninth. On this, list. and I'm sure most of the other 50 <laughs> further down, uh, Walt Disney World, Magic Kingdom, Orlando, Florida, 17 million a year, Disney Park, sorry, Disneyland Park in Anaheim, uh, I think about 16 million a year, uh, it's in, obviously in California. Paul, uh, so wait, you said the Eiffel Tower is not, or what, what it's rank 36th is 36 on this? No, list. you're kidding, yeah, yeah, it's faulty wow. research. It's not, it's not even the most visited, you can guess them, try and guess the most French. Oh, uh, Mona Lisa. Attraction. Disney. It's the it, Mona Lisa. It would either yeah. be the Louvre or maybe um, Paris Disney or whatever it's called. Yeah. The Louvre is 26th. Yeah. Versailles. Paris Versailles. is 16th. The Palace of Versailles is 48th. Uh, and the other one, uh, which is actually higher than the Louvre and uh, the Eiffel Tower and Palace of Versailles is Sacre Coeur. Uh, oh, the Roman Catholic yeah. Church. So Notre Dame. Eight, that's Notre, Dame. Notre Dame is number one in, okay. in, 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 uh, in, uh, in, 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 of in the France. French in France. In, All right. So the top France, one in the world. Yes. I mean, I've completely thirteenth blown it already. I'm gonna guess it's not the obelisk in Buenos Aires, which is what you're seeing <laughs> in the background there. <laughs> no, um, not that. So, Take one a, from my page. I'll give you a. I'll give it's you a the clue. Egyptian pyramids. No, nope. nine. One second. Nine of the top. Nine of the top ten are in America. What? Hmm. Yeah, it is the second most visited country in the world. The first most visited, though, is France. So oh. I'm surprised. That, so is it the uh, Grand Canyon? That is oh not Oh my God, here. it's no. Las Vegas it Strip. It's the Strip in Las Vegas. You're Googling it. You I am not. Look monster. at my Yes, right you here. are. You I swear to God, you. I'm not. Swear I'm not. America. But that makes me so sad. And everyone else listening, she Googled it. it I didn't Google it, but it's, how a, could it's the it number one be? tourist attraction. Yeah, 40 oh my million God, that makes people. me so sad. Is that, just, close... is that just made up of Americans going to the Las Vegas Strip, though, or does it does it exclude like it's probably people all of us going to conferences? Are, live in the U.S. who would just go there? It's a majority Americans, um, large majority Americans. But yeah, the top three: the Strip, 40 million; Times Square, 39; Central Park, 38. Uh, um, yeah, New York will be happy to know that they've got two of the top three. Uh, Union Station, DC, 33. Niagara Falls, 23 million. Grand Central Station, 22. Uh, Fennel Hall, Boston. Fennel Hall. Oh, yeah. Fennel Hall. Right. Um, and then the other one, so US is top nine, uh, one through nine. And then the 10th place is the Forbidden City. 
uh, Beijing, 15 million. Oh, wow. It's an imperial the, palace um, complex. Niagara Falls is probably the Canadian side, though, just saying. It's nicer on the Canadian said side. the U.S. and Canada. I knew you were going to say that, so I yeah. checked. It's the U.S. <laughs> and Canada. Okay, combined. Um, the only reason I knew the strip is because of the way your face contorted, and you were, like, <laughs> horrified by what number one was. So it was obvious. No, I saw you typing it. and reading the screen, and then you said, no. the strip? You absolutely saw me doing that. Oh, I uh, would never so. cheat. Plagiarism. If I was going to cheat, Susie, it would be for the, the, the week. retail. And the weekly listen. One year, two years, <laughs> five year ban. That's all wow. we've got time for for this episode. You'll see Susie never. Uh, thank you so much to my guest, though. Thank you to Susie for hanging out for her last episode. Thanks for having me. <laughs> thank you. To... <laughs> no, you'll see Susie on the first episode of the weekly listen in the well, new year. So I... She will be back, hopefully. <laughs> she probably hates me. But thank you so much to Blake as well. Yeah, happy holidays, everyone. Happy New Year. He will also be joining us for that episode. And huge thank you to this week's winner of the Game of the Week. And winner in general uh, is Paul Ben. <laughs> thank you all. Happy holidays. Uh, thank you to Victoria, who edits the show, James Stewart, and Sophie, who help us out massively with making this podcast a real thing. Um, thank you to everyone listening. So, so much to echo what Paul said. We really, really, really appreciate everyone giving even just a few seconds of their of their lives to this show. Uh, it means the world. So thank you to everyone who's listened to it, worked on it, sold it, everything. Thank you guys so, so much. We hope to see you guys on January 2nd for our next Behind the Numbers Daily episode in 2024, an e-market podcast made possible by Affinity Solutions, where we'll talk all about some 2024 trends. Happy weekends, folks, and of course, happy holidays.